Shabbat Shalom once again. At this time, we'll turn the services over to the great future priest, White Buffalo Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the PC always be with each and every one. Today I'm going to be talking about. Today I'm going to be talking about hanging on, hanging on like a bulldog. So my first scripture, if you would turn over to Genesis, Genesis 26, on page 20. Genesis 26, verse 4 and 5. It says, And I will make your seed multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your seed all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So you can see there, Abraham, he held on like this bulldog. And Yahweh gave him an, his reward in verse 4. So if we want rewards like Yahweh gave to Abraham, we have to hang on like this bulldog. So let's hang on. Yahshua hung on like a bulldog, even when he was tested by Satan and her workers. And one example of that is in Matthew 4, verse 3 and 4 on page 730. It says... So when the tempter came to him, she said, If you are the son of Yahweh, command that these stones be turned to bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. So you can see there, Satan tested him, and Yahshua still held on like that bulldog. Yahshua, even when he was arrested, he still hung on like that bulldog, and that example is in Matthew 24, 27. That's on page 758. Matthew 27, verse 43. It says, He trusted in Yahweh. Let him deliver him now if we will have him. For he said, I am the son of Yahweh. So it says right there, those four simple words written in black and white. It says, he trusted in Yahweh. And that's what we have to do, is trust in Yahweh. Pastor was the same way when he got arrested. He still held on to Yahweh's way, and he had Yahweh in his mind day and night. And he told them that he had not sinned, and he loved the work of Yahweh. This is how we have to be. We, too, can also become like this, because Yahweh says that we can do it. Now, I have some facts about a bulldog, and um, I can't read all of them for the sake of time, but it says, the description and definition of bulldogs. This medium-sized breed of dog has a massive head, powerful jaws, and short legs. Temperament, originally encouraged to be ferocious, so these dogs are very strong. This bulldog is very strong. It says this trait had been generally bred out of boxers, and many could now be friendly and loyal. They are often so they're trainable. They can be trained to be friendly and loyal. They are, they are often considered unsuitable as a normal family pet, as they require firm handling. 
pit bulls have been crossbred from bulldogs and a variety of different types of terriers. Origin of the breed. Bulldogs originated in England and was originally bred for bull baiting. Size, the size of the bulldog, the weight of bulldogs range from 40 to 50 pounds. The height ranges from 12 to 15 inches up to the shoulder. The alternative names of bulldogs and nicknames are the Old English Bulldog, the British Bulldog, and the American Bulldog. The coat and colors of the bulldogs. The coat is normally of a fine texture and smooth and comes in a uniform color, often with a black muzzle. The life of bulldogs, the life expectancy of this breed of dog is between eight to 10 years. So bulldogs, they age quick. After the first year of life, dogs are considered to be adults. So bulldogs age quick. They, they equivalent to 16 human years. After two years, they're equivalent to a 24 year old. And after three years, they're equivalent to a 30 year old. And if you wanna find out how old a bulldog is, after every year, you add five human years to determine the equivalent age of the dog. Bulldogs were originally bred to help with various jobs and tasks as bull, as bull baiting, hence their name, that's where their name comes from, the bulldog, because they were bred for bull baiting, and then they were also bred for guarding, so they, they're very strong and they're able to guard. The average cost of owning a medium-sized dog over a 10-year period is estimated as over $13,000. This provides a great idea of how much it costs to raise bulldogs. So you can see there, bulldogs, they have to be very, very strong. And this bulldog right here is showing its strength, biting into this um, dog trainer's sleeve right here. That's a, a pit bulldog. So bulldogs are very strong. Now, the definition of bulldog, of a bulldog, from the Webster Second New Riverside University Dictionary is a short-haired dog of a breed having a large head, strong square jaws with dewlaps and a stocky body. Now, Yahshua, puts these reminders to help us be like this bulldog right here. Sides in the clouds, the bulldog in the nebula, and then Pastor also puts these reminders out. He also reminds us, he provides us with these reminders like this to help us be like this bulldog. You should remember this too. Praise Yahweh. But any, anyways, on the second in the second book of Yisrael, going on to perfection, another great book pastors provided for us on page 168. It says, For Yahweh the Father will help me. Therefore, I will not be confounded. Therefore, if I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. I have told you before, you have to be like a bulldog. You have to be determined to do exactly as Yahweh says and not alter from it. If you do alter, all you are pr doing is proving that you are unfit for the kingdom. If you prove yourself fit, then you will be there and you will receive the power that Satan threw away. So he's showing there, you have to be like a bulldog. You have to be determined like that bulldog. And if you do, you'll, you will receive that power that Satan threw away. Another great book, The Building Moral Excellence and the Peaceful Solution, on page 131, 131, it talks about goal setting. And it says, where there is a purpose, there must be goals. Along with having a purpose, you should also have positive, realistic goals that will motivate you to succeed and that are beneficial to yourself and others. 
A goal is an end that you strive to attain. Having a purpose without setting goals is like running a race with no finish line. Think of your goal as a target that you direct your efforts towards. Having purpose and goals will keep you focused on maintaining a positive character by giving you direction and stability. And on the bottom it says, incorporate maintaining a positive character into all of your goals because goal setting requires character. So there, you have to set, you have to set this goal, which is to be in the kingdom and go about the right way to achieve it and hang on to it like this bulldog. Now, in the book of Yahweh, everyone has their book of Yahweh, so we, we all should have our book of Yahweh. Pastors told us to bring our book of Yahweh, a notebook and a pencil to services so we can take notes and stuff. And the book of Yahweh, we need to be like a bulldog and that's what we need to chew on is this book of Yahweh, and not this worldly entertainment that, the, that Satan is putting out there, trying to entice us in. We need to reject it and hang on to Yahweh's ways like this bulldog. And remem remember, hang on to Yahweh's way. So, pastors uh, offered us many House Yahweh publications that will help us be like this bulldog. For example, The Peaceful Solution, The Books of Yezhos, and then he's also provided us with the prophetic words, the monthly ones, and the newsletters. And then he also provides us with these reminders. And then there's various books and booklets that he's made. And then he doesn't want to leave the children out. He makes them children's book of Yishos, children's edition, so they too can understand how to be like this bulldog. So he doesn't want to leave anybody out. Praise Yahweh. Now, how do you hang on to Yahweh's way? In the back of your book of Yahweh, it shows the laws. And how do you hang on to Yahweh's way? Positive law number six. It says, hold fast to Yahweh. You can find that in Deuteronomy 10.20. So there it is. The law says to hold fast to Yahweh like this bulldog. But how do you do that? First, look at positive law number two. You have to submit to Yahweh. And then second, positive law number five. You have to serve him. And then, number eight, you walk in Yahweh's ways. And you keep walking in Yahweh's ways and you don't divert from them. And that's how you hold fast to Yahweh. So remember, be like this bulldog and hang on to Yahweh's way. And with this, I would like to turn it over. If you would all please stand, I would like to turn it over to the great future priest, Deacon Melchizedek Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Now, um, today, I'm going to be um, talking about the attitude of servitude. I'm going to go more into depth of what the speaker earlier this morning went over. Yahweh's laws show us that the kingdom of Yahweh is based on service to others. And Yahshua served Yahweh and the called out ones by his obedience when he laid down his life for the work of Yahweh. And if we could also turn over to Matitya 14. Matitya 14. Um, this is an example of Yahshua serving. Matitya 14, it's found on page 742. Matitya 14, verses 14 through 21. And Yahshua, he fed 5,000 people. It says, when Yahshua went on, he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for him and for them. And he healed their sick. And when it, it was becoming evening, his disciples said to him, this is a deserted place and the day is almost over. Send the multitude away so they may go into the villages and buy food for them, buy themselves some food. But Yahshua said to them, they do not have to leave. You give them something to eat. 
But they said to him, we have only five loaves and two fish here. He said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them, broke them, and gave the loaves to his disciples, and the multitude, and the disciples gave the loaves to the multitude. And so this is an example of him serving. Also, um, right over on page 743, Matitya 15, verses 32, it says, Then Yahshua summoned his disciples and said, I now have great compassion on the multitude, because now they have remained with me three days, and I have had nothing to meet eat. I am not willing to send them away fasting or they will faint along the way. And so he served these people, these 4,000 men. On verse 33, his disciples said to them, where are we going to get enough bread in this wilderness to fill such of a great multitude? And Yahshua said to them, how many loaves do you have? Seven loaves and a few fish. And he commanded the multitude to sit on the ground and he broke them. He um, looked up to heaven and blessed them, and then he gave them to the multitude. And so this is what the um, world would do with, to their slaves. If you could see in this picture here. That's a picture of a slave getting treated badly. And then also, if you see this, this is serving one another what the house of Yahweh teaches. So Yahweh's, um, when, Yahweh, when Yahshua walked on the earth, he set the perfect pattern for us to follow by becoming a servant himself. So Yahshua was a servant. <clears throat> and if you could look over to Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Yahshua Messiah who being in the form of Yahweh did not think it was something to be seized upon, to be equal with Yahweh, but abased himself taking on the form of a servant like men, like men being born. So he served the people. And Yahshua followed the example of Yahweh by being a servant. Yahweh as creator and heavenly father serves his creation continually. Without his service to us, we would not even exist. And if you remember in Genesis 1, yeah, Genesis 1, it shows how Yahweh here, he, um, he made the earth for man, and he served man here. And so this is, each of us must develop Yahweh's loving, caring character of servitude for others. For this is the only way we will enter into Yahweh's kingdom. So we must be a servant in order to enter into Yahweh's kingdom. And those who qualify will forever display Yahweh's character. They will serve the whole creation by their submission to all authority placed over them and by their true love and concern for the well-being of others. And Yahshua gave many parables about the kingdom of Yahweh. And he said, Yahshua taught them that he would be, who would be greatest in the kingdom of Yahweh must become a servant. And serving Yahweh and others in true love. In Matitya, Matitya 20, you can look over there. Matitya 20 verses, found on page 748, Matitya 20. And it's um, verse 26 to 28. Verse 25. But Yahshua summoned them and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles exercise control over them, and they who are greater still exercise authority over them. Um, let me see. But this must not be among you, for whoever is great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever will be first among you, he must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be waited on, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So Yahshua, it says there, how Yahshua said that the greatest in the kingdom of Yahweh must be a servant. And Yahweh's loss of slavery showed true love and concern for mankind. Helping and serving others by giving, giving for ourselves is the very type of character we must obtain. In the world today, 
Yahweh's righteous laws of servitude have been rejected and ignored. Instead, the man-made practice laws, which are all one-sided and used only for the owner. And so right here, um, like I showed the picture before of that slave and how he was being treated badly, that's how the world treats their slaves. And I looked up the word slavery, or servitude, I looked it up in the dictionary, and this is what they mean, what, what it means. Um, this is what the world thinks it means. It means um, serfs or slavery or bondage or punishment. So they think that serving someone is punishment. And so Yahweh's laws of slavery are far from the world's ideas of slavery. This is Yahweh's way of serving, if you remember. That is serving, praise Yahweh. And so it is, um, it, that shows true love and true concern for the well-being of others. And it is this servitude to others that will allow the earth to be rebuilt to a place where mankind can live again in perfect peace and safety. And so this is what servitude brings. Whenever you serve someone and you find joy in serving someone, this is what it brings. It brings true joy and true peace. And it's loving someone wherever you serve someone like that. And not to treat the person cruelly. It's serving for you to open up the door for someone or things like this. And we should find joy in doing those things. And in conclusion, I'd like to say we need to become a servant. And we need to serve others. And with that, everyone please stand. I'll turn it over to the next speaker, future priest Deacon Abba Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. <clears throat> you may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Now, um, I'm going to be continuing where I left off in my last speech about um, drunkenness. And we're going to get into some real-life examples today, uh, real-life stories about what drunkenness can cause. <clears throat> and... We're also going to get into uh, where drunkenness is being taught from and where this is being promoted. Now, uh, the scriptures warn us about uh, drunkenness and the effects it has on uh, your body. <clears throat> you can turn over the Proverbs. Proverbs 20. And if you look at verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler. And so whoever is deceived by them, not moderate with them, is not wise. <clears throat> okay. Now, this drunkenness, or this over-drinking <clears throat> of alcohol, it's being taught from the seven hills of Rome. And we have examples of this huh, in this time period. For example... This article right here, okay? It's entitled, Did the Pope Really Say That? Okay? Now, um, it's saying, this is the quote, quote, uh, Pope's uh, speech on the World Youth Day. Okay, and he was talking about how uh, we need saints who do this and this. And in like the middle of his speech, he says, we need saints that drink Coca-Cola, eat hot dogs, that surf the internet and listen to their iPods. We need saints that love the Eucharist, that are not afraid or embarrassed to eat a pizza or drink a beer with their friends, or many beers. I added that in there. But you can see that he's teaching this uh, example. And uh, from the Seven Hills. Now, because of what he's teaching, this is the result that it has. Now, this is a real-life story about something that occurred. Um, it was, this is a drunk college freshman. It says, a drunk college freshman managed to crawl into the dormitory bathroom, but that's as far as he got. Now, in this story, it's, in this article, it shows how um, if this boy wasn't found in time, he, would, he wouldn't be alive. Okay. 
Uh, he says, I found them in the sto toilet stall, barely coherent, with purplish vomit dripping down his chin. As the resident advisor, RA, I had to do something, but nobody had ever taught me how to deal with alcohol poisoning, and I never bothered to find out. I wiped off his face and let him lean on me as he staggered back to his room and collapsed in bed. I wiped off, uh, no, the next day, uh, he complained about a killer hangover, but at, le at least he was alive. No thanks to his clueless RA, he says. Now, he, ex he goes on to explain, and he says, um, in the minds of many young men and women, a party isn't a party unless someone passes out. They drink as much as, as much as they can, as fast as they can, practically racing to lose unconsciousness. Many wind up on the floor where friends, who are often drunk themselves, let them sleep it off. And every year, that's how uh, 4,000 people die from alcohol overdose, known as alcohol poisoning. And then he brings up a study about, um, in, published in July 2009, and it estimated that 1,825 1, college students died in 2005 of alcohol-related injuries. And then he uh, said that drinking also contributed to 500,000 injuries and over 600,000 assaults uh, among college students. And then he um, explains how uh, an average man who, knocks, uh, who takes uh, 14 shots of whiskey in three hours will reach a blood alcohol level of 0.4%. And we're going to get into that a little later. That's roughly five times the legal limit for driving. And it says at this point he could most certainly slip into a coma so deep that he could literally undergo surgery without waking up or feeling pain. Okay, that's how bad it would be. Uh, his heartbeat and st breathing could stop completely. Even if he survived, permanent brain damage could result. Okay, so permanent brain damage, that's for the rest of his life because of that one choice that he made. And then he talked about another story. It was an 18-year-old uh, at Chicago, Ch Chico State University who had recently pledged the fraternity died in one such case of a, with a blood alcohol level of 0.37%. That's more than four times the legal limit for drivers. Uh, he says, Andrian Hedman, whose mother said he rarely drank was seen uh, downing a lot of blackberry brandy at a Pi Kappa Phi celebration. He appeared to fall asleep, and by the time his friends had checked on him, he had stopped breathing. And then he died of asphyxiation as a result of alcohol poisoning before an ambulance could reach him. Okay? So that, those were two life, real life examples of what the Pope is teaching and the dangers of it. Okay. Now, uh, the drunkenness, it causes many things. It causes uh, things to be screwed up in your mind, and it harms your body. And it's been related to several uh, diseases and sicknesses. Now, I have an article from the National um, Institute on alcohol abuse and alcoholism. And um, it shows some of the, right here, it shows the different uh, levels of uh, alcohol in these different beverages. Uh, and beer, 12 ounce beer, it shows about 5% alcohol. Uh, and eight to nine uh, ounces of malt liquor, that's about 7% alcohol. Five fluid ounces of table wine, that's 12%. And uh, uh, 1.5 ounces of, uh, of 
80 proof shot, 80 proof spirits, that's about 40% alcohol. Okay, so you can see the different uh, averages of alcohol there. And then they have this chart for the um, blood alcohol content. Okay, it's called the blood alcohol content chart. Okay, and it shows here the different ranges that it has. For example, uh, right here about uh, 0, 0.05 percent, that's mild impairment. And it also shows how it could actually have a perceived beneficial effect, such as re relaxation. And then it shows it goes up and uh, it gets increased impairment, severe impairment, that, and right here it gets life threatening, okay? So that's their chart. But it says about how perceived, uh, perceived beneficial effects, such as relaxation. And the scriptures even talks about this perceived beneficial, or this beneficial effects that wine can have. We can turn over to 1 Timothy. Um, 1 Timothy 5, verse 23. It says, no longer drink only water but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So you can see there the uh, beneficial effects it has. Okay. And they even realized it in their time. But too much of it, it doesn't have a beneficial effect. It, has a, um, just, it causes destruction on your body. Okay. Now drunkenness is part of, it's listed among the things that the Gentiles would do. Okay, or the unbelievers. Okay, and we don't want to be among the unbelievers, do we? No. Okay, now if you can, if you can turn over to First Kepha, three. First Kepha. Three and look at or four, I mean, sorry. And look at verse three. It says, For this is enough that uh, in times past you performed the will of the Gentiles, living in licentiousness, lust, dark drunkenness, revelries, uh, bank banqueting or drinking parties, <laughs> abominable worship of God's Elohim and idolatry. Okay, so you can see there it's listed among the things that the Gentiles would do, or the unbelievers. And we don't want to be a part of that group, do we? No. Okay, now to sum all this up, this is what Yahshua would say about this. Okay, and this is what he says about this. If you can turn to Luke 21, verse 24. He says, so be on guard, be on guard, to see that is that your minds are never clouded with carousing, drunkenness, or anxieties and worries of this life. So that day will not come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come like a trap on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So, and because of this, watch and pray, so that you will always be counted worthy to escape all of these things which that will come to pass. And and to stand before the Son of Man. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, future priest, Zeke and Yaakov. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Today I'll be speaking about taking on the character of Yahweh. Now part of taking on the character of Yahweh you have to become like Yahweh. Now if you turn to Exodus, this is the 13 attributes here. Exodus 34. But uh, I looked up the word attributes in the, on dictionary.com and it means to consider the quality or characteristic of the person, thing, or group. That's the attribute. 
um, to regard as resulting from a specified cause. Now, so Exodus 34 shows Yahweh's 13 attributes. If you look at verse 1, it says, Yahweh said to Moshe, Chisel two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on those tablets the commandments that were first on the tablets which you broke. Then it says, be ready in the morning and go up to the mountain, on the top of the mountain. It says, no man shall come up with you and no man is to be seen throughout all the mountain. Then four, so he cut the two tablets of stone like the first. Then Moshe rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai. As Yahweh had commanded him, and he took the two tablets of stone with him. Then Yahweh descended in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. Yahweh passed in front of him and pro proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh, almighty, merciful, and compassionate. And then it goes through all the attributes. Now, if you, in the seed of Yeshalakin's booklet, um, that was given in 2003, when we would have the workshops like we do now, but they would give us a booklet and they would, the priests, the Kahans would teach out of that booklet. Now, it, the uh, 2003 Seed of Yeshel Hawkins booklet has all the attributes listed out and it explains them all. Now these are Yahweh's 13 attributes in Exodus 34. In fact, I'll read them to you here. The first one is Almighty. And Yahweh, we know He is Almighty. He, um, what you see here in this room, you see the beams, the pillars, the chairs, tables. Yahweh has made all of this for us. Now, if you turn to Exodus 4, verse 10. On page 47, Exodus 4.10, it said, then, then Moshe said to Yahweh, O Yahweh, I have never been an eloquent speaker, not in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Yahweh said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? It, it is not I, Yahweh. Now go, I will help you and teach you what you shall say. So this is what shows that Yahweh is almighty. The second one is merciful and compassionate. Um, for that one, if Second Kepha 3 verse 9. Second Kepha 3 9. That's on page 962. It says, Yahweh is not slack concerning his promise, and some, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but come to repentance. That's for merciful, compassionate, and long-suffering. Yahweh is not slack in what he does, and he is long-suffering. That's the third one. Um, for your notes for long-suffering, Jacob 5.10. Then you have abundantly blesses his own. That's the fourth one. The fifth one is possessing righteousness and truth. The sixth one is keeping mercy. The seventh one is forgiving. Yahweh is forgiving if you turn to Isaiah. Isaiah 1 verse 19. It says... Um, verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins be like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like chrism, they will be as wool. If you will be willing and obedient, you will eat the fruit of the land. And it shows Yahweh is forgiving. He will turn your sins, since they're like scarlet, red as blood, they will be turned to white as snow. You will become perfect. Then um, the eighth one is judge's sin. The ninth one is heavenly, heavenly father. Um, Exodus 20, verse 2. Um, that's on page 63. No, 61. 
It says, I am Yahweh, your heavenly father, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So he is a heavenly father. The tenth one is making the covenant with his own. Um, that's Hebrews 10, 16. He will make a covenant with us if we will turn to him. Now, he will become our father. Eleven is doing mighty works. Um, as you see, he uh, parted the Red Sea for the when um, Pharaoh let the people go. Then 12 is worthy of reverence, and 13 is zealous. Now, Yahweh is zealous. I looked up zealous in the dictionary, dictionary.com, and it's um, devoted or diligent, full of, uh, it's characterized by or due to zeal. Yahweh is zealous for his plan and to see, his, to see the prophecies being fulfilled. Now, Yahweh's plan in Genesis 1, verse 26, that's page 1, it says, Then Yahweh said, I will make man in my image according to my likeness. Now, this is his plan. They will have rulership or authority. That word means authority over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing, that creeps upon the earth. Now these are the microorganisms. As you know, if you melt one of these beams down, it's the microorganisms that are changing and they melt it down. So this is Yahweh's plan and he's zealous to see his plan fulfilled. Now, in order to become perfect like Yahweh, to take on the character of Yahweh, we have to become perfect. As you know, I. Um, the scripture has been read before, Matthew 5, 48. Is, it says, therefore become perfect, just as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. And we have to be perfect to take on the character of Yahweh, because Yahweh is perfect. So remember to be, um, have Yahweh's attributes in you, and become like Yahweh is perfect. And with that... That's all the time I have. If you all please stand, I'll turn it over to Deacon Shaloma. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Today I'm going to be talking about do not take on the character of the gods. If you'll turn over to Leviticus 19, it's on page 97. Leviticus 19 and verse 4, it says, Do not turn to God's Elohim, nor make yourselves molten images. I am Yahweh, your Father. So I looked up the word God in the American Heritage Dictionary, and it means a being of supernatural powers, believed in and trusted, especially a male deity, thought to control some part of nature or reality, one that is worshipped, idealized, or followed. So you can see there that a god is, is one who's trusted on by the world, not by the house of Yahweh. A being of, of supernatural powers. And, but in the book of Yahweh, we know that a god is one who lifts himself or herself above the creator or above the one sent, Yeshua Hawkins. Now, if you'll turn over to Deuteronomy 12. Deuteronomy 12, and verse 30, it's on page 150. Page 158. There we go. Verse 30, it says, Be careful not to be ensnared into following them by asking them about their gods, Elohim, saying, How did these nations serve their gods, Elohim? I also will do the same. You must not worship your father, Yahweh your father, in their way. For every abomination to Yahweh, which he hates, they have done to their gods, Elohim. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their god, Elohim. 
Whatsoever I command you, be careful to observe and do it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. And where it says, in verse 31, where it says they burn their sons and daughters in the fire, that's, it's not just talking about the god Moloch, in, you can see in Leviticus 18, 21, it's talking about also giving your children to the military or the armed forces so that they can kill other people, turning your children over to them. And in verse 30 where it says not to be ensnared into asking them about their gods. We can do this in many ways. Well, the world can do this in many ways by looking it up on the internet or talking to people out in the world, talking to the fallaways. You can read about it in magazines, books. But do not be ensnared into asking people how they worship their gods so that you can do it. Because in the house of Yahweh, we don't worship gods. Now, a couple laws that talk about this is in Prohibitive Law 3. It says, do not take on the character of the gods. Another one is Prohibitive Law 6, and it says, do not worship, serve, obey, nor follow the ways, laws of the gods. And then Prohibitive Law 10, it says, do not seek to learn the ways of the gods in order to follow them. If you turn over to Deuteronomy 4, it's on page 150. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 16. It says, watch that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves a god, El Taraf, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman, or like any animal on earth, or any bird that flies in the air, or like any creature that moves along the ground, or any fish in the water below. And when you look up to the sky, and you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all that which is arrayed in the heavens, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things Yahweh has allotted to all the nations under heaven. So do not make these, these gods, do not become corrupt into doing this. I looked up the word corrupt in the American Heritage Dictionary and it means to destroy one's honesty or integrity of, to destroy the honesty or integrity of, to ruin morally, to pervert and to contaminate. And when we make ourselves th these gods and when we worship these gods, we're perverting ourselves, we're contaminating our brain and we're destroying ourselves and then we will fall as you see an example of in Isaiah 14 where where um, it says that they will they will be like I I want to be on the most high I will be like the most high I will raise myself above the stars of Yahweh but then you will fall as it shows in Proverbs 5 you will fall down to the ground into Sheol, the grave. And then you'll be like, why did I even do this? But, um, so what can the gods do? Well, you can see the gods in, in Psalms 82, that Yahweh was judging them. But what can Yahweh do? He can create the heavens and the earth, which the gods can't do. He can heal the sick, raise the dead, he can create things out of nothing. He also can create people. He created the heavens and the earth. Now, why shouldn't we be like the gods? If you'll turn over to Psalms 135. Psalms 135, it's on page 490. And it says, Verse 15, the God's Elohim of the nations are nothing but silver and gold, only the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. 
They have ears, but they do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make gods, Elohim, become just like them. You become just like the gods. So is everyone who trusts in them. They are as powerless and as senseless as the gods, Elohim, they worship. Yahweh wants us to be in the image and likeness of him. As you can see in Genesis 1.26, not in the image and likeness of the gods, because they cannot do anything. They are senseless. And those who make gods become just like them. And with that, that's all the time I have. And don't be like the gods. Remember to serve Yahweh, follow Yahweh, and obey Yahweh. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the great Deacon Yeshua. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. The title of my sermon today is, What Should We Teach Our Children? Now, first, let's take a look at what the world teaches their children. Well, the children in the world, they're taught that it's okay to steal if they don't get t caught. They're taught it's okay to call people names, that killing is okay if you're in the military. Children are familiarized at a young age with destructive weapons, weapons such as tanks, missiles, bombs, and they're allowed to watch movies, play video games, where they witness countless acts of violence. I have an article here. The effects of video games on children, what parents need to know. And I'm going to read a little bit out of it. It says, children began playing video games for increasing amounts of time, and the games themselves became more graphically violent over time. Parents, educators, physicians, and researchers began to question what the impact of these changes might be. Among elementary and middle school populations, girls play for an average of about 5.5 hours a week and boys average 13 hours a week. Playing games is not limited to adolescent boys. Recently, the Wall Street Journal reported that several companies are now designing video game consoles for preschoolers. The amount of time spent playing video games is increasing but not at the expense of television viewing, which has remained stable at about 24 hours a week. When video game play is analyzed for violent content, additional risk factors are, absur are observed for aggression aggressive behavior and desensitization to violence. Now, so they're making these video game consoles for preschoolers, which it says are the ages two two to five. So they're uh, making video game consoles so eight, the children ages two to five can play these violent video games. It says, it says here, looking across the dozens of studies that have now been conducted on violent video games, there appear to be five major effects. Playing violent games leads to increased psychological arousal, increased aggressive thoughts, increased aggressive feelings, increased aggressive behaviors, and decreased pro-social helping. These studies include experimental studies where it can be shown that playing violent video games actually causes increase in aggression. Correlational studies where long-term relations between, between gameplay and real-world aggression can be shown. The average school age student spends over 37 hours a week in front of a screen. That's a, a, over a day a week in sitting in front of a screen watching violent movies, playing violent video games. So soon these children are gonna be wanting to drive tanks, shooting down people. And if we let our children play these violent video games and watch these violent movies, we are preparing them for war. I have an article. It's called Nastiness. Video or 
Video nastiness. Kids as young as four act out violence they see in computer games teachers reveal. And this boy here uh, actually killed his mother after watching uh, or after playing uh, computer games. He killed his mother with a hammer. It says here, we all expect to see rough and tumble, but I have seen little ones acting out quite graphic scenes in the playground, and there is a lot more hitting, hurting, and thumping in the classroom. So these children as young as four are acting out what they see in these uh, video games. And then this article is Virtual Reality Prepares Soldiers for Real War. And it talks about this man here, one blistering afternoon in Iraq while fighting insurgents in the northern town of Mosul, Sergeant Swales opened fire with his 50 caliber. That was only the second time he says that he ever shot an enemy, a human enemy. Now listen to what he says here. It felt like I was in a big video game. It didn't even phase me shooting back. It was just a natural instinct. Boom, 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 boom. Remember Swales, a fast-talking, deep-voiced, barrel-chested 29-year-old from Chesterfield. He was a combat engineer in Iraq for nearly a year. Like many soldiers of the 276th Engineer Battle Lion, whose PlayStations and Xboxes crowded the trailers that served as their barracks, he played games during his downtime. Halo 2, the sequel to the best-selling first-person shooter game, was a favorite. So was Full Spectrum Warrior, a military-themed title developed with help from the U.S. Army. Now listen to this. The insurgents were firing from the other side of the bridge. We called in a helicopter for an airstrike. I couldn't believe I was seeing this. It was like hallow. It didn't even, it didn't even seem real, but it was real. So he played this game so much that it desensitized him to where he could actually take a human's life and it didn't even bother him. He says it didn't even faze him. So this man here, he was desensitized. Now I looked up the definition to desensitize. And it's, it says, is to make less sensitive, make less likely to feel shock or distress at scenes of cruelty or violence or suffering by overexposure of such images. So this man was that desensitized. He was desensitized by playing this violent video game that really taking someone's life did not bother him at all. Now what occurs when we teach our children Yahweh's laws and the peaceful solution? Turn over in your books of Yahweh to Deuteronomy. Uh, chapter 6 and verse 7, and that's on page 152. And it says, And you must teach them diligently to your children and talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you rise up. So we have to teach our children. Well, children, if they're taught the laws of Yahweh and the peaceful solution, and if they apply what they're being taught, well, they'll be respectful. They'll be obedient. They won't engage in risk-taking behavior. They would go and teach others. Now, in the Peaceful Solution book, the Peaceful Solution, on page 428, it says, The world is now suffering because of the failure of the parents, teachers, and leaders to adequately teach their children, whether the results of te are temper tantrums to carrying guns into the schools to mass murders. The problems start at home. It starts when the children are allowed to carry toy guns around the house, to play cops and robbers, and to color army men in their coloring books. The whole world shows violence on television, and the top stories on the news are murder, death, and destruction. 
This is constantly taught to all. We must instead teach the book of the law to our children. So I think we can all agree that it's better to teach our children Yahweh's laws and the peaceful solution and put the violent video games and put the violent movies away. Because all they do is influence our ch children in the wrong way. Praise Yahweh. And it doesn't, these violent video games and violent movies, they don't teach our children how to solve conflicts peacefully. They teach our children to shoot the person who's, who's uh, hurting you or who stepped on your toe. So let's continue teaching our children the laws and don't let in the violent video games and violent movies. One more thing from this book on page 400. It says at the top of the page, page, <clears throat> if all nations practice this law to teach the book of the law diligently to their children, those very children would grow to have a deep appreciation for what the laws of Yahweh can do for those who practice them. So remember to teach the book of the law to your children because we don't want our four-year-olds going around acting out what they see in these movies and video games. Uh, we don't want our children taking guns and shooting their neighbors. So teach these laws to your children. And there are better things to buy for your children than these violent video games and movies. You can buy them the peace tunes from the Peaceful Solution and these books that the House of Yahweh puts out. And it's my great honor and privilege, if you'll all please stand, it's my great honor and privilege to present to you our next speaker, the great deacon David Knighton Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, saints of Yahweh. Please be seated. Praise Yahweh. Okay. Got something special for you here today, if I can get it all lined up. All right. So, may the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. And I got to tell you about something that occurred to me over the past three days. Every time I got ready to go out of the parking lot, it seemed that the radio station was always, Pastor Sermon was always on the same sermon at the same place for like three days in a row. And he was talking about the desire, the zeal, the, the want that uh, Yahshua had and how he looked forward to hanging on that stake. All of his life, he looked forward to hanging on the stake. He was fulfilling prophecy. He knew what his job was to do. And thinking about that, you know, for, for him, imagine this for a minute, if you will. I imagine when it, when it got to that point where he finally saw this coming about, where he, he knew that, okay, the time is here. The time is now. And it was going on in his mind, like, this is great. Here it comes. I can't wait. And that's the kind of attitude that he had to have to be able to deal with what he had to deal with. He had to be the most humble person, too, to deal with having his beard plucked out, the beatings, to be, to be hung on the stake. And then blessing, not cursing in return. Anytime anybody said anything out of whack or, or said, did anything wrong, he, he blessed and not cursed. Well, pastor's the same way. You know, pastor's been looking forward to this for a long time of what's taking place right now, which we'll talk about in a minute. But he's also been looking forward to everything that's coming our way. Not, not because he enjoys seeing some destruction of people or anything. He's looking forward to the kingdom where there is sin never again. And he knows that these things have to take place. They've been prophesied. Looking towards these things with joy. Let, let's turn to Matthew 24 real quick. Matthew 24. And that's on page 752. Matthew 24. And look at verse 9. He looked at it with joy. The desire was there. He knew he was going to be arrested. He knew he was going to go through some things. And he knew some people would leave too. He knew these things were going to occur, and he looked towards it with joy. He warned us in advance that we should prepare our minds for what was taking place. Look at verse 9 on page 752. It says, Then they will hand you over to be afflicted, and will call for your death, is actually what they did, and you will be hated above all people for my namesake. 
Remember how Pastor was just overjoyed when he heard that he was hated more than Al Capone? He was worse than Al Capone? That's because he'd been looking forward to this for so long, looking forward to these prophecies being fulfilled. And I can tell you, because I testified myself to this with a great Kahan, with our own eyes, we saw the way that Pastor blessed and didn't curse. And you've all seen it too on the videos that show Pastor, you know, during the arrest being transferred from facility to facility. You've seen him blessing the people with the message of Yahweh rather than cursing them. Blessing, not cursing. He was very excited to be doing these things. And, and I saw that he obeyed every rule that was put before him by those that were uh, in authority at that time uh, in the facility where he was at. He obeyed them, and he did it without talking back, and he did it with joy, knowing that this is exactly what Yeshua did. He knew what he would do. You know, imagine, what does pastor think about every morning when he wakes up? He thinks about fulfilling prophecy. About fulfilling prophecy. Fulfilling prophecy. We need to have this same attitude. It is always on his mind, and it should be on ours. It should be on ours that we want to get so more involved in this work as the day goes on and fulfill these prophecies, bring forth these things. If you will, turn to 2 Kepha 3.11. That's on page 963. Page 963. Page 963. 2 Kepha 3, verse 11. 2 Kepha 3, verse 11 on page 963. It says, since all these things will then be dissolved, dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be, ought you to be in holy conduct and righteousness? Holy conduct and righteousness, the conduct that the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program teaches us. And then you must look for, now, like Pastor, looking for that time when he was going to be arrested. Like Yahshua, looking for that time when he was going to be arrested and nailed to the stake. Look for and earnestly long for the day of Yahweh, because of which the heavens will be dissolved in fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for, we look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Verse 14, therefore, beloved, since you are looking forward to these things, looking forward to it, being zealous for it, wanting it to come, be diligent to be found spotless, blameless, blameless, and at peace with him. Peace through the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program. And if you will, turn to page 572. Page five, 572. That's Isaiah 66, 20 on page 572. And they will bring all your brothers for an offering to Yahweh out of all nations on horses, chariots, and litters, on mules and camels to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says Yahweh, just as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of Yahweh. And that's what we're doing. The, we're, we're fulfilling these prophecies so that we can bring forth an acceptable offering to Yahweh. An acceptable offering through the people that are coming into this house where the teachers are teaching teachers to teach teachers to teach to teach peace so that we can sin never again. In verse 22 it says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make remain before me, says Yahweh, so will your seed and your name remain. And that's the work we're doing now. I, I got to say, Anyone in the house of Yahweh, if I knew what the children in the house of Yahweh knew now, which I am in the house of Yahweh, and I, I, I do know most of what they know, I think. They probably know more than me. But if I knew what the children in the house of Yahweh know now, I would want to be a teacher in this house. Praise Yahweh. Be a teacher. Have that desire and instill it within your children. You know, all the children, if you look around, the children, the, the great emphasis that's taking place on the children at this time. The future priests, you know, allowed me recently to help out in a class, and it was on Pentecost, and I really enjoyed it. This class, um, they were teaching other future priests. They, these 
teachers, these young teachers, were being taught by teachers who had been taught by teachers who had been taught by the teacher, Pastor Israel Hawkins. We've all been taught, and we're teaching the young teachers, and the young teachers are teaching young teachers, and it just goes on and on and on. Just like Yahshua. Yahshua taught young teachers. He taught young men to be teachers, and they went out and taught. And you can see some of the, well, you can see the results of their teachings. Look at the deacon Stephen that they taught and how he stood up for righteousness. You know, these missionary trips, we go out and yes, we have teachers that teach the young teachers. Well, these young teachers will be going out with groups of young teachers teaching peace throughout this entire earth. And and this prophecy that's being fulfilled, you've heard it before. Turn to page 692, please. I know you've heard it before, but you need to hear it again because it's taking place now and you need to want to be a part of it and you need to want your children to be a part of it. And children, bug your parents. You know, I mean, you know, ask them, ask them, ask them till they bring you to these classes. Don't let up. Turn to page 692 and that's Yael 228. Or 693, I'm sorry. And it will come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, but your sons and daughters will prophesy. And all of us are Israel Hawkins' sons and daughters. And you have sons and daughters, and they will be prophesying if you bring bring them to these classes. You know, everything has to start somewhere, and you can see the result of what's taking place now in these young teachers that are being presented before you. They are teaching. They, they, they are so close to perfect, it's unbelievable. So we've got to have these teachers, and it's just like in the days of Ilya. Ilya, Samuel, Yahshua, it's the same thing. You know, the school of the prophets, pastor, pastor, there's this nucleus of the house of Yahweh that taught us, then, then we teach others, and then it continues. And to the children, I want to say, you know, don't be scared. Don't be scared to, to come to class. Don't be scared to stand up at the podium and, and, and learn how to give the announcements and learn how to speak. You know, we have classes for the young children. We have speech classes for them now where they can learn to speak and actually have ex- the experience of getting behind the podium and talking to the congregation or the congregation that sits in front of them at that time. So we have to instill within our children this desire to want to be teachers. It, it's... It seems that there's the children that grow up in the house of Yahweh have this kind of, kind of original desire to, to want to get up there and do that, to want to teach, to want to be part of this. And we need to encourage that. Pat them on the back for it. Encourage it when they go to class. It's up to you, the parents, the teachers. You are the teachers, too, that are teaching the teachers. We're all teachers. Remember, Pastor said that all the children are ours to teach. He said we should be teachers, that we should look at all the children as ours. We're a group. So you got to remember this too. It's by teaching that you become a teacher. Yes, you can read the Peaceful Solution books. You can read the books of Israel. You can read the book of Yahweh. But you've got to put it into practice, and you have to practice teaching. It's by this that you become a teacher. And look forward to these prophecies being fulfilled. Imagine yourself behind the podium speaking to the congregation imagine yourself children imagine yourself going out on a missionary trip i know there are boys that have imagined this and thought about it all their life and guess what they do it now they put it to work in their life and they asked and they came to every class they could come to and guess what they're there they're doing it you can do exactly the same thing if you show up and get your parents to bring you here Yahweh gives us our heart's desire, and our heart's desire should be doing this work and teaching others. I just got to show you one or two things here real quick. Oh, by the way, on, uh, on Pentecost, I got to show you some of the teaching that was taking place. Here's a, a young teacher teaching some of the men, <laughs> and he did quite a great job of it. There we go. That one's kind of dark. Here is a class where the young teachers <clears throat> are teaching the young teachers, they're having an opportunity on Pentecost, on Pentecost, where the Spirit is poured out upon the seed, upon Israel's seed, right there. They're having the opportunity to teach, to learn to do these things, to learn to teach the world true peace. 
And in the book of Israel, in the children's book, and I'm using the children's book because Yahweh willing, they've all been reading these books. You shall not hate your brother or sister in your heart. You rebuke your brother or sister, frankly, without hating him, without showing hatred. Look down here, it says, he who hates. Don't hide your little faults and think this is not going to matter because the seed is supposed to be totally holy or totally rotten. So if you're doing something, if you're doing what I'm fixing to read next, we need to adjust that. Hatred stirs up strife. If you're oppressing or annoying someone, see, that's part of the definition of hatred. If you're oppressing or annoying someone, you should start trying to overcome these things. And Yahweh says he knows you can. And here's some of the do's and don'ts that we should be doing. Whatever you have to do, control your emotions. Our minds should be on Yahweh's holy words and learning the laws. Develop the love, the true concern for your brothers and sisters. And if you have a fault, admit it and start overcoming it. Don't get in these tiny little groups that you get into and bar the rest and make someone feel like an outcast. And also, teachers, all you teachers out there, parents, children, everybody, all teachers in the house of Yahweh, you've got to teach the children. Teach the children. Pastor shows us this law, praise Yahweh. He shows us this law. He says, apply it to your family. He says, be willing to teach them at the breakfast table, at the supper table. Teach these laws to your children to help them to be a part of that kingdom forever and to help bring forth this acceptable offering to Yahweh and that we all may enter into the kingdom together. And with that, if you'll all please stand. Don't forget, imagine this. Imagine doing these things. It's my great honor and privilege at this time to present to you the great Kahan Ilya Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. Continuing right along with the young men and the great deacons and, and all of these things that we're seeing come to pass in these last days, it's an ever-growing fulfillment of the words that our great teacher, Yahweh's anointed seventh Malik is, Malik is speaking and warning this world of what's to come. Um, this last week in Abilene, there was an article that was put up on the Big Country homepage, and it was entitled that Abilene Churches Gather to Pray for Rain. Now, the article reads, uh, with Abilene's critical condition and lasting drought, every drop of rain counts throughout the big country. The rain that Abilene received last week helped, but it wasn't enough. So people from different churches throughout Abilene came together on June 1st at Beltway Park Baptist Church to pray for one common issue, rain. Pastor Scott Beard of Fountain Gate Fellowship said that it was great to see people from different denominations come together for a common purpose and pray together. Mayor Norm Archibald and Chief of Police Stan Standridge were also in attendance to pray for rain. Chief Standridge spoke about the surprising statistics on how badly rain is needed to declare the drought over. Notice the drought. Chief Standridge said that Lake Fort Phantom Hill was last full in July of 2007. July of 2007. Well, you know, we, very quickly we go to the book of Yezreel, and let's see what Pastor was saying in July of 2007. How many people would document everything they say and put it out for everyone to read for multiple years? You know, think about that. Well, this is Pastor's words in 721 of 2007. He says, I've got to show you, but some great things are taking place here. This is the first evidence we've seen that they're reading the real reason for the ozone disappearance. You've got to get this article. But the drought, you know, the famine that Yahweh predicted, that Yahshua predicted by the inspiration of Yahweh in Matithia 24-7, we're seeing this now. We're seeing the evidence spread. He went on to say that you see it coming. He was asking the congregation, you see it coming? Praise Yahweh. It won't be long before they'll understand what Yahweh says. And what Yahweh is actually causing. They'll somehow, they'll get this. The world's going to have to know what they've done. And then moving on to verse 13, he says, But anyway, this is what Yahshua said. We should start believing him pretty soon. Everybody you know should start believing him real soon. 
And we're seeing this more and more, the prophecies, we're seeing it build rather rapidly now. So seven years ago when this drought started, Yahweh's seventh Malach was here warning the people. He was telling the people that their actions, what they're doing, is going to cause consequences. He has foresight into these things. He can see what choices bring before we see the results of them. That's the ability that Yahweh has given his anointed Malik. He can see into the decisions that are made, and he's teaching us to do the same things. He's teaching us to become like Yahshua and to have a mindset like Yahshua, just as he is doing, and of course, Yahshua taking on Yahweh's very image, all of us coming in complete unity with the same character. Turn over to uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 on page 906, and we see... What was it that separated Yahshua from those in his day? What was it that Yahshua had to constantly remind his apostles of? What was it that made him to be the first of all amongst the family to be born in this great kingdom, to actually enter into the kingdom and to set at Yahweh's right hand? Well, in verse 4, let's look at chapter 10 and verse 4. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in Yahweh for pulling down strongholds, demolishing arguments, and destroying every high thing that exalts itself against the one who is Yahweh. Yes, these ones without the authority, bringing under control every thought in the obedience as the Messiah did. Yahshua Messiah was able to bring every thought into subjection. He did not say things uh, without seeing or having foresight in them. He did not make or take action without having this foresight. He was able to bring everything that he did, everything that he said, he was trained from youth, just as we're seeing the training of the young men and young women in the house of Yahweh, along with adults alike, to bring every thought into subjection. That's why it's so important that we get our children into class. Thoughts are being put into their minds constantly. If we let the TVs train them, they will be trained to think like this world, to think like Babylon. If we let Yahweh's house train them, they will learn to think like Yahweh, become like Yahweh. It's just like baking a cake. If you want to bake a cake, you have to use the ingredients. If you want to make a child and turn them into a teacher of righteousness, if we want to become a teacher of righteousness, we have to take what Yahweh has given us so that we can learn to bring every thought into subjection. Turn over to Matithia chapter 15. Matithia chapter 15 on page 743. Matithia chapter 15, and we're going to be reading verses 18 and 19. It says, but those, thi those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. Notice that. Out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. Look over to the side note, G2. It says, all sin, not some sin, all sin proceeds from the wickedness of man's imagination. From the thoughts. Remember, every action begins with a what? It begins with a thought, and those thoughts lead to feelings or emotions, and of course, in the end, we have actions. Yahshua, Messiah, brought every thought into subjection. Therefore, his emotions were always under control, and his actions were always righteous, never evil. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, False witnesses, notice false witnesses, those who turn against Yahweh's house, those who lie, betray. Um, when you see that, you see a person that is not controlling their thoughts. They've never learned to control their thoughts. Blasphemy, the breaking of Yahweh's laws. Be turning over to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. It's very important. In fact, it is the first and foremost thing that we must learn to do in becoming like Yahweh is learning to think like Yahweh. See things the way Yahweh sees them. Understanding such as eating pork. Knowing that, yes, the animal is unclean, but knowing down to a micro level of what actually occurs when we take this in our body. It's not just you eat a meat that Yahweh didn't like, so he cursed it. No, Yahweh created something for a job, and he said, if you put that in your body, you're going to die. It will not mix in the chemicals that your body produces. 
And if you do it, you're going to die. Well, that is the understanding and the way of thinking that we must have. We must be able to perceive these things the same way. In Proverbs chapter 15, Proverbs chapter 15, we're going to read verses, uh, well, verse 26, verse 26. It says, the righteous, well, wrong one, 26, it says, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to Yahweh, but he is pleased with the words of the pure. Now, the words of the pure, remember, they're thinking. They're thinking, they're bringing their thoughts into subjection. Well, the fool doesn't consider what he says. He just lets every word go. In fact, many times, well, I said that without thinking. Well, no, we're always thinking. Thoughts enter our mind constantly. We just don't control every thought when we say things. But if you look back over, remember, the, wor the words of the wise are pure. But look over to um, chapter 12 and verse 26 on 504. It says, The righteous should choose friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. You know, remember, go back through the acceptance unit of the junior high Peaceful Solution Character Education Series. Chapter 4 alone goes through in detail the proper procedures for choosing friends. You know, consider that when you come into Yahweh's house. If someone speaks against the one sent, if they speak against what the administration has done to govern Yahweh's house, why did you come to Yahweh's house? Was it not to be a part of learning how to be like Yahweh? Never let someone, never ever let someone bring you against the only one sent to speak on Yahweh's behalf. That is foolishness. In fact, it's stupidity, actually. We'll get into that here shortly. It, it's stupidity. Um, look over to, oh, since we're already there, page 507, Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18, and look at verse 6. It says, A fool's lips enter into contention, so his mouth calls for a beating. A fool's mouth is his destruction. His lips rob him of his opportunity for eternal life. A fool, just like Yahshua Messiah said in Luke um, chapter 24, verse 25, old fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Well, you know, pastors recently said, don't be stupid. We could be stupid. Well, what is the definition for foolish or fool? Well, it means it's of a person or action. It's an adjective to be foolish. It means lacking good sense or judgment, unwise. Now, these are the synonyms for foolish. Stupid, silly, idiotic, witless, brainless, mindless, unintelligent, thoughtless, half-baked, harebrained, imprudent, incautious, unwise. Um, they get worse, actually. Uh, reckless, informal, dumb, dim-witted, half-witted, crack-brain, crack-pot, pea-brain, wooded head, and we'll say dumb donkey. Um, that is the definition. So stupid actually sounds pretty kind when you start looking at what the other synonyms for that word is. But if we speak against, if we don't believe all that the prophets have spoken, we become very foolish. We become ignorant. We become stupid in learning and applying what we've been taught. And we cannot have this foolish character. We cannot be of someone who is, who is of an unlearned mind with all the training that is offered. Um, you know, the young men you just seen speak. Think about this for your own children. On average, they are taught in a school surrounding anywhere from 50 to 70 hours a week. They're educated. Every week. Now, think about that. If we want our children to be teachers, how much time should we put into them? Remember, Pastor said at the age of four, impressions are put in. We should be very careful what impressions we put into our children's mind. It's very important. If we want them to learn, we must educate them. We must teach them. They must learn Yahweh's way of righteousness. They cannot be like this Babylonian system. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. And we're going to read verses 1 through 3 to begin with. Because we see these things taking place in the world. All of the leaders are always seeking peace, trying to bring peace. There's peace this, peace that. And one thing they never has is, is, is peace. It always escapes them. But Yahweh says in verse 59, or chapter 59, verse 1, and this should be a very familiar scripture to everyone, it says, Behold, Yahweh's hand is not shortened, then it cannot save. His ear heavy, that it cannot hear. No, it's not Yahweh that's cutting someone off. We choose to cut ourselves off from Yahweh. It's not his fault these things are taking place. He's letting us choose. And he's also sent us a teacher to warn us of what we're doing. 
In verse 3 it says, For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, sin. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue, once again a tongue, these words being spoke, has muttered perverseness. Look down to verse 6. It says, Their webs will not serve as clothing, nor will they cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity. These actions they're taking. And the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet are swift, or their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Notice, their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. These thoughts are running wild. And when wild thoughts take place, when uncontrolled thoughts take place, emotions run wild. When you don't control your emotions, your emotions control you. All of us, we fall into that category. Um, write down for your notes, more on emotions, read chapter 2 of the self-control unit of the junior high series. It goes into great detail about what emotions are, how important they are, how they make life interesting, but left uncontrolled, they will control you, and negative consequences will come from uncontrolled emotions. Um, looking up to verse 8, it says, They do not know the way of peace, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever walks on them will not know peace. No, they will, like verse 10 says, they will grope. They will grope at noonday for answers, like a blind man walking in the dark. They're going to look for these things. You know, speaking of blind men walking in the dark, um, Pope Francis has invited Mahmoud Abbas and Shimon Peres to the Vatican tomorrow. Tomorrow they're supposed to come together, pray for peace, and plant an olive tree. You know, um, <laughs> uh, you almost think you'd get more success out of having Mo, Larry, and Curly do this. Um, you know, for those of you that don't know who that is, it's people that make decisions based upon stupidity. Uh, why is it so important that the Pope has invited these two to the Vatican? Well, consider, back in 1993, there was a signing of an agreement. September the 13th of 1993, there was an agreement signed in Washington, D.C. Now, there were formal agreements signed in Paris, France, which came from the meetings of Madrid, Spain, but the, the actual ceremonial signatures of this agreement took place September the 13th of 1993. Most people think that Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat signed this agreement. That's not true. They witnessed the agreement. The signing of the agreement was done by Mahmoud Abbas and Shimon Peres, along with Warren Christopher, who was the Secretary of State, and then, I'll have to look at his name real quick, Andre Kozriv, and I probably butchered it. That's the Foreign Minister from Russia. But that was the actual signing that took place on September the 13th. They're still alive. Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin have passed away. But the original signing, the Oslo Accord, was done by those two men. Now, once again, here comes the Pope calling these men in to pray for peace, to have peace. Well, you know, they haven't done well thus far, and they're not going to do well um, moving forward. But like Pastor has told us, he's showed us what's taking place before it takes place. If you're the one causing the problem... It's kind of easy to swoop into a situation and now we have peace. But you can't control the emotions of these people that you've been teaching the ways of war for so many thousands of years. You can take out your instigation, but you still can't control the people that have their fingers on nuclear weapons. Because we have a nation, we have a world that operates on emotions. Everything is based on emotions. They're not controlling their thoughts. Look over to chapter 55 of Isaiah. Chapter 55 of Isaiah. And look at verse 6, starting with verse 6. It says, Seek Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. In verse 7 it says, Let the wicked forsake his own way, and the unrighteous man his own thoughts. Let them come to Yahweh's house. Let them learn how to think like Yahweh. Let them be taught by the only one sent in these last days. Let him return to Yahweh, and he will have mercy upon him. Return to our Father, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says Yahweh. If we do not learn to bring every thought into subjection, to think like Yahweh's anointed Malak, to conduct our lives in 100% agreement with Yahweh's house, to make everything second to Yahweh's house, everything we see, everything we say, everything we do, we should live and breathe what it takes to build Yahweh's house. That should be our first 
and foremost focus. We should never let that escape us in any time. We're never, the house of Yahweh is never a part-time position. It is a full-time, eternal position forevermore. Um, real quickly, praise Yahweh, real quickly look over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians found on page 896. 896. It'll be 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. You know, we all have, many of us have been here for many years. Uh, we have people that have come recently, and, and there's always people contacting. There's people all around the world wanting to be taught. Well, we here at Abel have been call, called to learn how to be teachers of teachers, and that's what we must do. And that should not only become a, a job, it should become a passion for each and every one of us. We should literally get up, rise up, wanting to fulfill our jobs of learning to teach other people. And that requires us to to be on our toes and conducting ourselves in a righteous manner. But in verse 11 of chapter 13, notice it says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Or when I became a woman, I put away childish things. Well, what are childish things? Look over to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, page 510. And look at verse 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And remember, from the heart, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. We have a rod in these last days, also known as a branch. And if we take the correction from that branch, we will no longer speak with foolishness. We will speak with wisdom. We will have much honor in Yahweh's sight due to our adherence to the words that we've been taught. 